apologies, all right. Okay, doc. Um, hello, everybody. We are live on a Celtic State of Mind. Um, I'm joined, as always, on a Friday by Tony Haggerty. How are you doing, Tony? I'm very well, Laura. Yourself? Not too bad, not too bad. Um, we are joined today by the ever generous Brian, who has given us an hour of his time on this Friday. How are you doing, Brian? I'm very well, thanks, Laura. It's nice to, nice to be <laughs> here. I was getting slaughtered last week for no being Tony, so I can get slaughtered this week for no being Jim. Exactly. So oh, listen, I, I, don't know. I just like to set myself up nice for the weekend, so no, I can't, I can't wait. <laughs> I don't know if that's complimentary or no, big guy, you know what I mean? So, <laughs> there's only one you and there's only one me. That, we like that, don't we? That's, L- that's listen, we're not talking about Jim, that's for sure, because he sent us a picture to the group chat of the Statue of Liberty. He's out off in his jollies on the other side of the Atlantic, so I don't know. Yes. Folk are just heading here, there and everywhere with the new freedom we've all got, which is good to see. But uh, <laughs> he's, he's, he's kind of jealous, though. Him, Miko and Graham are on a yellow card for the Globetrotting. Absolutely. Robert. I mean, I, I kept it pretty stoom. I could have I could have flooded the group chat with the pictures of Disney World and I never. But, you know, that's probably something to do with the lack of interest in Disney World that might <laughs> the Axon group. But we'll leave that there and ca- crack on. <clears throat> um, back in action for the first time this pre-season. Picking up essentially where we left off is a phrase you used, Brian, before we came on air. Um, and I'll come to you first on that basis. Um, what did you make of the match uh, and the opposition that we were up against? Well, <clears throat> my thoughts on the match have to be caveated against the fact the opposition were rotten, right? You know that <laughs> this season. I mean, so you can't get too excited. But what I was pleased about is what we done. And I thought that we sort of almost... It's just, as I said earlier, picked up where we left off. We we went back to playing that style of football. The players looked pretty sharp, considering um, it was a first pre-season game, and it was a very, very much a, a sort of skeleton BRC side we played. Um, you know, with the exception of a couple of players. So actually, I was I was really quite impressed. I thought that we didn't look we looked very sharp. Um, I thought Hatati looked on it, and again, you will caveat that way. The opposition, but it's more about what he, he was doing with the ball, his movement, uh, the way he was run, pressing off the ball, his passing. Um, I thought the boy Kenny, that's really good for him. He showed a bit of confidence. He does, or he did, in that game, what any sort of young player given a chance should do, and he took it. Um, I thought Vata had a, a very good finish for his goal, and I thought uh, Lol looked really strong at the back. Again, wasn't he facing much of a challenge, but you can sort of spot, always think, players that are coming in that are just there to, to fill a gap and you can spot players that look comfortable and I thought all three of them looked particularly comfortable. So, yeah, it's really, really pleased, actually, especially considering where we were last pre-season. Um, it's a, a, a marked improvement. Do you know, I, st- I keep getting a, a... This happened last week, but I keep getting a kind of funny feeling in my stomach every time someone says lol, because I keep thinking we're talking about the old lol, not the new one, but... um. We'll leave that there. Um, Tony, what do you make of Brian's comments? I think I think don't think it takes anybody um too much experience of watching football to know that the opposition we were up against was nothing great. But I mean we've we've lost to some pretty bad teams in preseason in the past. So even still it's encouraging. The object of the exercise is that's what you do to these kind of teams. I think it was Job Steen that used to take Celtic abroad and play amateur teams and you know fourth and fifth tier teams so that Celtic could run up cricket scores. Get your eye in. That's the whole point. Get that match sharpness and match fitness against a team that, yeah, they're out on the park, but they're not going to offer much challenge. But that, that's the whole point. And I think, uh, I think Vim Janssen's team won 21 nothing in his first mm-hmm. ever pre-season friendly, if memory serves. So that that that's that's the idea. And to get, get give guys some game time and get them to come on and impress and I think lots of people impressed, and and I, we are allowing for the for the opposition. But if you can't impress in those situations, then you know there's a problem. So real Hatati was head and shoulders above everybody, as you would expect. He mm-hmm. did good. He was excellent, absolutely excellent. You know, and it was good to see him get like a full ninety minutes. But he looked, you know, I, I thought the players' body language, their intention, and you know, the in the way that are they learning, are they conforming to the pattern that the manager wants. And they all did. Johnny Kenny scored two cracking goals, as Brian says. Mikey Johnson, even, you know, my thoughts on Mikey Johnson, I still think he should go out on loan or, or 
maybe his future lies elsewhere. But, you know, you can already see that Harry Q influence because he's starting to listen and learn and do things. Still shades of old Mikey there. We've been in the same movie before. Looks like a world beater in pre-season, panel beater when he comes up against decent opposition, you know. So, not that old chestnut, but there you go. And uh, Rocco Vata took his goal like a seasoned campaigner. For a young guy who had so much time and space to run into, he buried it. You know, and I looked at all the young players that come on, all the B players, and they were all desperate to make an impression, but they all weren't scared to express themselves. And I loved that. Yeah. You know, they made a mistake, they didn't care, they get back up and at it again. You know, and, and that and that's what the managers, that's the managers uh, philosophy and style coming through in them. You know, on you go, go and enjoy yourself, go and express yourself. This this is your chance, show me what you got. And they all look really good, didn't they? They all they all contributed. And again, yeah, you know, nobody's worrying about the result. You want to see if there's a style and a philosophy and a pattern emerging there. And there was. They did take off from where they were uh, left off last season, as they say. And, you know, it was quite pleasing. It was one of those pleasing pre-season friendlies because your eyes were darting everywhere as to who was on the ball, who was doing what. You know, even McCarthy did did OK, I thought, you know, and look, looks a bit leaner for a start. You know, whether he can hold a, a regular spot down in the midfield is MD's guess. Lots of people still criticise him for being slow and slowing it down, but I still thought he showed a decent range of passing throughout the game. When it was crisp, it was sharp, it kept moving, it was quite quite fluid. You know, so I, I, I was quite impressed, especially with all the, the B team players that came in and low I thought just looks like a big unit, doesn't he? But he looks quite calm and composed. He, I was looking at him and thinking he's calm and Carter Vickers esque and his stature and the way he mm. holds himself. I'm not comparing the two players. I'm just comparing the way the two look and move around the football pitch. And again, as Brian said, he wasn't really tested, but he, he looked he looked he looked apart. You know, and that's all that's all you can ask for. Yeah, and as Brian and I were talking before the match, he looked a damn sight taller than five foot nine, which is what he's listed as on the website, I'm led to understand. So um yeah, I'm whether that's I'm accurate or not, I know five but... foot nine, but I'm not an imposing figure really, am I? You know what I mean? so, <laughs> It's yeah. all about how you carry it, Tony, all about how you carry it. I mean, so yeah. Mm-hmm. Um I'll get on yeah, to yeah, Mikey yeah, Johnson. I, I, I spend nights lying away, Dean never been five foot nine, so <laughs> <laughs> it's a lot of ambition for me. No, I remember no. an old boss say to me one time, he says, if you ever reach five foot seven, me man, they would not love me. <laughs> <laughs> well, I've got I've got no ground to stand on here because uh, I need a stool to reach the top shelf of the fridge in my house, but uh, that's <laughs> neither here nor there. Um, Brian, I'm going to come on to Mikey Johnston to talk to you just to talk through a bit of the points that um that Tony raised. Um, but before I do that, uh, Lanky Six Seven said, just popped on to hit the like button. Have an awesome day, trips. Keep it green and white. If you are so inclined, please do hit the like button. It helps us get shared and get out there. And also subscribe to us. I believe we're not that far away from 19,000 subscribers. So thank you to everyone who's already done that. And uh, anybody who hasn't, please get on if you like what we put out. There's usually content every single day on the channel. So um, you're never short of something to watch if you're twiddling your thumbs. Um Brian, I wanted to um just talk to you a little bit about Mikey Johnson. I'm I'm of the I'm of the school of thought of Tony where, you know, I, I didn't get a chance to see the game live. I watched the, the highlights and the, the group chat was flooded with, you know, oh, maybe this is Mikey Johnson's year. And and, and as Tony said, he's, he's, he's heard that song before. Um, and I, I tend to think that, you know, he, he's had enough opportunity for me to prove whether he's a Celtic class player. And up till now, I've not seen it. But every time we go into preseason, there's something there that you think um, that might be might be long lasting. Ange was actually asked about this um, uh, as reported in Football Scotland, and he says Mikey is one of those players. If he stays healthy, he has ability. We know he's got talent. He's got to be able to do that on a consistent basis. He's in an area of the park where we've got some real competition and real quality. That's what he needs to be able to do uh, to match the other guys in his position. Other guys like Dyson, Jota, Liel and James Forrest. There's no reason why he can't do that. Um, I I read that and I thought there's some massive caveats there and I love everything Ange says. But he's mentioned two things. Staying fit and healthy. And, then, and a list of four or five players there who 
he obviously says that are based on what he says are again uh, ahead of him in the in the pecking order. What's your opinion on Mikey Johnson? Is there are we going round in circles with him? Is there any chance of a long lasting Celtic career for him? Are you seeing anything that would suggest that we're going to get better out of him this season than we have before? So my, my <clears throat> instinctively I want to just say no and move on. But <laughs> the thing with Anja is if I'm just calling him out and he seemed to he was quite positive about him last year, he obviously sees there's something there and he thinks he can work with it. And given the improvement he's made in the squad across all parts. I mean, we everyone wrote off Ralston um, before the season and nobody could believe when he signed a contract and he's turned Ralston into a, a, a very decent player. I don't see it happening for Michael Johnson, but mm-hmm. I'm sort of loath to go against Angie's feeling. What I would suggest is he's a very good footballer, Michael Johnson. He really is. I just don't think he's a Celtic player. I think yeah. it reminds me, I've used, used this comparison before, but remember Gary McKay Stephen when we signed him from Dundee United? He did all the hallmarks, he, he was drinking in and out, he was he was fast, he was tricky, he was a talented player. But he just couldn't quite ever make it, he just didn't have that step up. And I think Mikey Johnson's in the same the same boat. I just think there's a there's a player there with ability. I just don't think he's 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 good enough to to, to make it at Celtic. Um, I think is he better than uh, Dizan, Jota, Forrest, Abada? No. Is guys like, is he standing in the way of a guy like Vata or Moffat coming in and maybe having a greater scope for level improvement? That's another question. I would suspect MJ will moonwalk out of Celtic Park <laughs> very quickly on loan or otherwise. I think uh, Andrew's putting in the, the shop window. Um like a beauty queen from a movie scene. And, uh, right, I, right ha- hang on a minute here. <laughs> I was about to say yellow MJ, card right. for the MJ thing, but uh, you're you're on a you're on a double booking here almost. I'm giving you a warning, a yellow card, and a warning anymore, no, and you're fair, off. A yellow card, <laughs> but a warning. I think, I mean. you know, I, 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 to sum up, I, I think good player, likable boy, but I don't think he's got a, a strong future. Yeah, I think. Uh, you know, Ange says here, irrespective of what happened last season, they're all starting from a space where they can stake a claim and make a contribution this year. I, I'm, I believe he'll probably contribute as much as they did last year. The odd, very good game, but it'll all come down to his fitness. You, you mentioned there that he might be standing in the way of somebody like Moffat or Vata. I don't subscribe to that in in the sense that I think. If a player's good enough, they will overcome whoever's in front of them to get a place in the team. Um, so I'm not sure that that's um, necessarily going to happen, but it'll be interesting to see what happens. What's clear is we've got options, both from the people we've brought in and the young players, and that's what's important. Uh, Mark Mack, 1967, on YouTube says, do we have to waste more time on Mikey Johnson? No, we do not. We will move on. Um, Tony, I think... Watching the highlights of that game the other night, another player that kind of came to came to the fore for obvious reasons based on the season he had last season, the contribution he made in the game, is Christopher Julian. Another player whose Celtic future looked bleak only a matter of weeks ago and, and things may have turned around for him. Um, what do you see happening with him? Do you think he'll still be a Celtic player come the first game of the season? Do you think... It's just a chance to put him in the shop window. Where where are we with him? I think it's certainly a chance to put him in the shop window, but the, the doors are jar, isn't it, with Carol Starfelt's injury, and we don't know how long Carol Starfelt is going to be out for. Now, do you sell Julian whilst Carol Starfelt is injured and you've not got adequate cover? I'm not so sure. And the manager himself said that while he's a Celtic player, he'll treat him as a player of the football club and do, you know, and do what, uh, do, do treat him the way he's treated, he's treated every player. You know, I, I guess that Julian, Julian's future lies in his own hands, doesn't it? You know, whilst he's here, you know, knock your pan in and, you know, be the player that everybody thinks you, you are and can be. You know, he played okay the other night, scored a goal, <laughs> stole uh, your man's thunder, didn't he, with the header off the post, Johnny Kane? Mm. <laughs> I think I was called a goal poacher or a goal grabber in primary school or whatever, you know. And uh, but still was it, still was it in the right place to head at home. So, but you know, 
I'm asking of Julian if he's if he sees his own future lying elsewhere, so be it. But whilst he's been asked to pull on that jersey for the first team, then give it give of your best, give us your lot, and don't don't let us down, don't let the manager down, don't let your teammates down. That's all you can ask. But you've got a feeling that his head might well be elsewhere, and that's something that Celtic are going to have to confront moving forward. But Andrew's always quite cool about these things, isn't he? Mm. Even if the guys are agitating for a move, he's like, fine. But whilst he's here, then do what Christopher Ayer and Ryan Christie did last season. And uh, you can argue the toss whether Ots and Edward did the same. But two of those three certainly gave of their best until they moved on, didn't they? Yeah. You know, Edward, a lot of people accused him of that phrase, downing tools. But, you know, Ed, uh, Ayer and Christie gave of their best for Ange before they, before they quit the club. So we're asking the same of Julian. As I say, Starfelt's injury is supposed to be back for the start of the season, but if he misses a lot of pre-season, then would you throw him in at the start of the season against Aberdeen, you know, fitness issues? You know, so there's all sorts of things to consider. And are you going to sign another defender? If that's mm-hmm. the case, then that would certainly make the writing on the wall for uh, Julian. But I'm inclined to just say to him, look, we start again, we go again, we move on. Whatever happens, happens. You know, your move to Schalke broke down. Fine, you're still here. With, while you're still here, and I ask you to do me a turn and give me a shift, will you do that for me? Be as professional as you can be. I think that's all you can ask of Julian at the moment. And the other night, he, he looked okay. He, again, not really tested, but might get a test on Saturday against Rapid Vienna because opposition's ratcheted up a notch. So we'll see, but and if he's called upon to do a job again, then he's hoping he, he, he acts professionally. Yeah, I'm, I'm hoping so. I'm, I have to say, when they moved to Schalke and the pictures of the aeroplane and all that kind of stuff, you were like, you're you're playing with fire in this day and age in case something like that doesn't go through, I think. It's, it's much better, in my opinion, to to keep it behind closed doors just in case you're in a position where you end up back where you started. But nonetheless, as long as he's a Celtic player, I'll still, I'll still cheer him on. Um, Ange actually spoke to um, Sky Sports about him uh, earlier in the week, uh, about him and I think Ayeti and maybe a couple of others who whose future at the club is uncertain. And this, Brian, I was telling you before we came on here, I want a book full of Ange quotes just to get mm. me through. Day, but this was this is what he said. He said everyone's future is the same. Everyone's future is unknown. None of us have any certainty about what we do. All we can do with Chris and the others, they're training with us and uh, they're with us. I'll treat them as one of our players. I think that's fair enough. Um, Brian, what do you make of some of Tony's comments there about where Julian's uh, future lies with us, and more importantly as well, the point Tony brought up about um, you know depending on what options we have and his fitness, do you think he's fit and, and raring to go for a, for a start uh, in the league this season if we have to put him in straight away? Yeah, I would think so. The, the interesting thing, we, it, it, it reminds me of when we let Craig Gordon go because we thought we were getting Fraser Foster in and we ended up with Barkas. I was <laughs> in that position. I think Julian will go if or when there's a replacement coming in. Hmm. The question will be, does his depart? Does any arrivals depend on Julian's departure? I'm not 100 percent convinced of that. What will be interesting is if we make the assumption that Starfield will be fit, but maybe not match fit for the first game of the season. If Julian starts next to Carter Vickers, I think it could feature in the team moving forward. Mm. If, he, if it's Welsh or Lol, say the starting his place, I think right is on the wall probably. Because you'd have to think now, as I see it. I would say it's Carter Vickers, Starfelt, Julian, Welsh, Lowell or Dean Murray. That's the sort of running order, I would imagine. Yeah. But if Anne sees it as Julian behind them, then I don't see him considered a, 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 a long-term member of the team. But what I think <clears throat> we, need to, we need to consider as well is, like Tony mentioned, there was rumours of players sort of down in tools and stuff before. Some players had the right attitude and just kept going even though they wanted to leave. Some didn't. I don't think Ange for a second will tolerate that. Mm-hmm. I think any sort of, you know, acting at training or not putting the effort in or not doing it, I just don't think you need a squad. I think even if you want to be there and, and you're trying your best but you're just not good enough or not putting in the effort, you're not going to be there. So 
I think anyone that's there under Ange will be training and playing the right way. It's just whether or not he sees them as long-term solutions. And I don't, I, I said last season when Julian was out for so long and then when he played for the B team and I, I felt he was, he was probably going to go. Uh, and I still think that. I don't think he'll be part of the, the squad come the, the start of the season. However, it does depend on those other factors and he might surprise us. And, and I say, look, I like Julian. I think he offers a, he offers something that we don't have at the club, which is a, a centre-back that can score goals with the head. You know, mm-hmm. he's a real, real aerial threat um, in the opposition's box. We don't have that. And he did look pretty comfortable on the ball. So it remains to be seen. If he leaves, he goes my real wishes. If he stays, he'll, he'll retain my real wishes. Yeah. Um, just seen some of the comments uh, coming in. Um uh, a few different opinions here. Will McMillan on YouTube says, let's face it, Julian is miles better than Starfelt, but Ange doesn't fancy him. Um, Paul Whitworth says, not sure why Ange does, doesn't prefer Julian over Starfelt. I believe we keep Julian and add another centre-back to what we already have. And uh, just touching on Albion Ayeti, um, for me, he just hasn't proved himself. I think that's I think that's fair enough to say. He went from captain in the side in Ange's first pre-season game last season to not featuring at all, but that's the that's the fickle nature of football. It's a, it's a, a long time in a season. Um, Tony, just before we move on from the Christopher Julian thing, uh, Brian mentioned there about the, the pecking order of defenders and, and where they are. Um, do you think that's the way Ange operates? Because I have to say, I'm thinking of last season and how he did swap players in and out and you know was looking for a squad of players who could easily replace each other when required. And it makes me wonder if there is such a thing as a pecking order with him or if he's just looking for four or five good options um, at the back. Do you think that exists at the moment or it's something that he's trying to eradicate? I think he's also working on you know, shape and partnership yeah. and stuff uh, during pre-season. Because you want, you want your partnerships to be comfortable, don't you? You know, so, you know... Julian and Law is not going to be a central defensive partnership for the first game of the season. But what he will want is guys comfortable playing in, in a role either as a left or right centre back. So we'll be playing them in a kind of natural position. So he'll play the best that he feels is available to him in that position. That, that That's the way I think he'll go about his business. I don't think he pays too much attention to pecking orders, but I don't think Brian's wrong in the kind of assessment of where he might rank certain people. You know, that's the thing. But I I think at any given time, you can play your way into that team with, again, the way, you know, watching it training. And and he won't allow for slacking because they go full tilt at training. He tells you they replicate games and training sessions and stuff, so he, he has them all at the top of their game but what he'll want is people that are comfortable in certain situations, so and I I don't I don't think, I think there's method in what he's doing with Julian yeah. in the time for the eventuality that he might have to put him in beside Cameron and Carter Vickers, the likes of Boston Law, they're just introducing them to the first team set up and how it's done and get them comfortable with the, with the B team are training the same way, playing the same way. This is how it's done when you reach the first team against not substandard opposition, but, you know, third tier Australian league opposition. Fair enough. But yeah. guys like Julian, you'll be saying to him, right, now, if you're playing there and you're beside Cameron Carter Vickers, then nothing changes, but you would trust them to do the job. So you might find as the games progress and Starfelt's not there, that he's going to have to play Cameron Carter, Vickers and Julian in the in the uh, maybe likely event that the two of them could feature against Aberdeen because Starfelt's not match fit. So that that's that's a consideration. So you're going to have to play them at some point to make sure that they have a development, you know, a, a, make sure they develop an understanding and are are sweet with each other's game. So I, I'm kind of thinking that's why Julian has come back into his thinking, getting game time. And also, if that's the case, and he wants him to put himself in the short window if he does see him leaving, but I would be loath to let him go at this moment in time until they bring in A, a replacement that they're happy with and B, that can 
you know, was first team ready and can fit seamlessly into the structure and the system. And, and yeah. again, Brian alluded to there, they, they had that situation situation with Craig Gordon. So hopefully they will have learned from that and he stays. And again, I think every Celtic supporter will isn't we do well. Yeah, the guy the guy thought he was going elsewhere. It, it, it's fallen through. But I think we all have to act in, in the way that the manager has and says, while he's with the club, you know, you give off your best and we'll give you your of our best towards you. You know, you don't wish anyone any, you know, any ill because you want to see him succeed. And if he succeeds in a Celtic jersey, all the better. If he succeeds elsewhere, so be it. We'll go with our best wishes. But just do what's required and don't upset things. I think the timing of his comments was what everybody questioned, wasn't it? Hmm. And the team were doing well, and I, I don't have any truck with players being unhappy at not playing. That's what you want, but you don't want them going to the media and bumping their gums when the team is very successful. There's a reason why you're not playing because it just smacks of petty lip stuff, doesn't it? Yeah, you know, I'm sure the manager will have explained to him why he's not playing. The manager did say he has to wait for his opportunity. And Cameron Carter Vickers and Starfelt have con- conceded the least amount of goals in the <coughs> Premiership last season. They pressed them, they were the two favoured centre backs. It's, it's no hard to work out, is it? Yeah, I think I think like you say as well, though, it's like you know, we we come on this podcast and a lot of the coverage that we do is based on our experience of having watched football for, for a number of years and in and, and some cases within the Axom group having covered it professionally for a number of years. And you do want to avoid speculation, but I think um, the questions about his attitude, the questions about his, his willingness to work hard are much easier to question when he gets to the point where he is coming out and speaking to the media because you'd, you'd have to think that by the time a player decides to do that, the frustration has been building for some amount of time and, and that he would find it hard to hide in a, a professional setting. So so like we've all touched on, I hope I hope whatever's happened that that led to him not getting back into the team as quickly as he would have liked last season is, is a thing of the past. And if he is going to stay around, he buys into to what Andrew's doing because... As we've seen already, any player who buys into what Andrew's doing is is on the road to success. Um, we're going to get to Hatati and Idiguchi um a little bit later, but I just wanted to um update everybody. Last week, obviously, I hinted at it, but I was at Celtic Park for the um unveiling, if you want to call it that, of of Jota. Uh, front row, perfect seat to view the man in all his wonderful glory. We were actually. <laughs> We were actually advised uh, <laughs> that uh, not to ask many questions about his hair, which was interesting. <laughs> so I don't know how many people were were planning on um sort of wasting an opportunity to speak to a Celtic player by asking him about his hair, but uh, but we took it on board anyway. Um, Brian, I'll come to you first. I think the impression I got of him was that Benfica was. Obviously, a huge emotional range for him to come away from. Uh, he talked about having been there since he was a child. Um, he's obviously still a big supporter, but having been in the room and watched him answer questions and watched him engage with people, which I think you get a lot more from than just snippets on the on on the internet. It was very clear to me that he was very happy, and that a major reason of that was the culture that's been created by the manager. Do you think? if we can attract a player of the type of calibre of Jota away from a, a boyhood club of his, away from a club where he was going to get Champions League football, where he probably was going to win titles, if we can do that for him, surely we can do that for, for a high calibre of player across Europe. I think so, yeah. Uh, I've got to say, we were all very jealous you got to meet Jota. Yeah, I left him I, say? I was furious. Um, <laughs> but <clears throat> I think that, it, you know, one of the other things just before... The answer your question is the way he comes across and I think Ange is similar in other players are when it's sort of fan media he seems so relaxed and sort of joking and, and sort of warm and I thought it really he came across as such a nice person and I think that's indicative of the squad it's one of the things that Ange seems to have built up um, even made the joke about the I don't know who it was that asked him the question but then he said oh my god that is so Scottish Remember oh, that that was that was our Declan. Was he was, Declan? There for, oh, uh, for, he was there for another outlook, but it was Declan. Yeah. Um, 
and I thought that was very funny. So he seems a good character. And in terms of you know getting to the club, I think it's such a huge cue for us because he's such a good player, and I think he's got like massive, massive potential. But one of the things that I think makes Celtic at the moment so attractive, we are biased, right? Because we love the club and he has such a such a important part of our life and in our hearts. But for a player, what he's got is he's got a team that's playing a very attractive attacking form of football that's training at such high levels, high intensity, that if he goes to a a, a, a bigger funded club or a club in the EPL, he's not going to have any dropping standards in, in terms of his own standards because he's trained at such a high level with smart players running about him under a fantastic mm. coach and he gets to showcase that in the Champions League. I think for any player at the moment, we are, even if they have no attachment to the club, even if they don't care about the club in terms of the way we play, it's such a viable, attractive option for a player at the moment. Well-trained, you know, high-intensity attacking football, big profile, Champions League under a great coaching setup. I think those are things that are going to continue to attract. And I think that, you know, I always go back to it, and you mentioned it earlier about the things Anne says. One of my favourite things he's ever said was that he, he brings in people, no players, and mm. you can sell that through that squad. And I think that adds to it, because if you're happy at your work, all of us have had jobs where we've hated somebody we've worked with, and it's murder. If you don't like the people you work with, you don't enjoy it, doesn't matter how good the job is. So you've got a, a team element there, a culture there, they all seem to get on, they all seem to bond well, and they seem to enjoy it. And I think that's excellent. So as much as it's great to have Jota at the club, I think what that sh- illustrates is that good quality players and good quality people want to come and play under Ange in this setup, and that can only be good for our success moving forward. Yeah. Uh, Brown Warrior comes in and says, to be fair, Declan was knackered after walking Ange's duck. <laughs> <laughs> Which is fair enough. Um, Tony, it's it's just an interesting talking point and something that I reflected on after being in the room. I, I've spoken been to in you. The room of, was that Jota? That was Jota. I don't know if I told you. I was I was at the press conference yeah, last yeah. Friday. Yeah, yeah. How, uh, um, how close uh, are you from Laura? How close oh, are you? I mean, you've got to t- say less than 10 feet away. Less than 10 yeah, feet, yeah. which was, yeah, uh, yeah. I was basking yeah. in his... Um, uh, he's throwing, throwing women and children out the road to actually clamber to get to within ten feet of him, were you? Interestingly enough, I was I, I was the only woman in the room apart from um apart from really? the press officer. Uh, so there was only going to be one that needed thrown out the way. But uh, well done, but yeah, no, I had a I had a, a free run at him, but I composed myself. Um, <laughs> no, did you, keep your did you keep your shape? Yeah, I kept I kept my shape. <laughs> I, I don't. I'm, I'm glad about I, I, that. I mean, I'm not going to, I'm not going to comment any more on that. But yes, I did. Um, <laughs> no, the, the thing I was going to ask you was because I know we've had a lot of discussions about. I, I, I'm quite a cynical football fan, and as much as I love Celtic, as much as I love this club, and think that everybody should love this club, it's the same as what Brian says about the culture that we create and all that kind of thing. I'm very aware that players that are coming to play for this club are not that way inclined and won't necessarily be that way inclined. We've seen it with players come and go before who haven't fallen in love with the club. What what shocked me really a lot about being in that room was the fact that it was undeniable that that thing of, you know, you talk about the Martin and Neil era of players who quite clearly fell in love with the club and still have a big place for it in their hearts. I guess the question I want to ask you is, is there is there something different about Celtic, especially under a manager like Ange? Can we offer something to players that they just aren't going to get, even in, as as Brian says, a bigger league with more money, with with more coverage? Right, let's not forget, if you're t- talking about Jota, right, this is a boy who was Benfica daft, right? Wanted yep. to make his name with Benfica. Came to this country in a 12-month loan deal with an option to buy. Everyone thought the dot, dot, dot was the option to buy. Try before you buy. And this club got under his skin. This manager got under his skin. This culture got under his skin. Teammates got under his skin. The Celtic supports got under his skin. This guy's first love was Benfica. And I wrote last week, he's got a new love now, and it's Celtic. And that's happened in the space of 12 months. So you talk about there's something, there's something special about this football club. It's even more special when you have special people running it. And at this moment in time, we have a special manager. 
who I don't know what he does. I also wrote that he performs a Jedi mind trick when he speaks to footballers on the phone as well. And just, yeah, you know, and as, and I wrote, these are the droids we were looking for, i.e. <laughs> and Carmen Carter Vickers, because he's convinced these guys. But go back to what Brian said, Celtic are one of the most viable options for a footballer to sign for in Europe if you want to advance your career to A level, because the manager wants to go to that level. So why not Celtic? Jota thought that as well. It was never in any doubt that Jota was going to sign for Celtic. He's running about New York with a Celtic jersey on. You want a picture of happiness? You watch Jota's interview to media and fan media. The guy doesn't stop smiling at the fact he's signed for, for Celtic. Mm. There's a guy from, it's like planting me in the middle of Lisbon and saying, and then me saying, I love Benfica. I spoke Lisbon because it's green and white, if you prefer. You know, after 12 months and saying, I love Celtic, but this is my new love. I mean, that's incredible. No, that doesn't happen overnight. Mm-hmm. It's a gradual appreciation of your surroundings, of your manager, and see if you're a good person. Brian alluded to it, but the manager bangs on about being a good person. See if you're a good person, you embrace all that. And see when you're at Celtic, see if you absorb all that like, like a sponge. It, it can't wash over you. It seeps into you, or it should. You know, we are biased, so that's how we naturally feel. But you think of the amount of players that have came into this club with no a connection to it and all of a sudden they can't speak highly enough of it it doesn't happen by accident it's, you know it's it's a design you know it's, it's just they come in you know the whole that Celtic family thing and all that but there is something special about this football club and I, but at this moment in time there's something special about the people that are running the club the manager the players the board and the supporters are in sync, they're in tandem. And in, we spoke about that pre-season friendly this time last year. We were a dysfunctional family last year. We're now, we're now a close-knit family. And it, is it a surprise that guys like Carter Vickers and Jota have bought into it? No. Not really. Because they signed a manager who was successful, yeah. Sceptical at first, but came in and... You know, slowly but surely gone about the job. And see, I look at a guy like Vinicius Souza just to pluck a name out the air and someone who Celtic was supposedly uh, interested in. Mm-hmm. See if you think that going to Espanol is going to advance your career to any kind of level, then you're sadly mistaken and you're not the droid or the good person we are looking for, as Ange would say. You know, so... You move on and you get the people, because I think he said the other day he's still two players short of areas that he wants to improve in. He has a plan, A, B, C, D. Don't you worry about that. So those two good people or two good players will be out there. They will come. They will fit seamlessly into the jigsaw like the others have. But I look at the likes of even Bernabe, who had no connection, flew halfway across the world like Ange, like the Japanese players, and I've come in and I've gone, wow, this is something else. And you just sit there and they're not even kicked a ball for Celtic and the guy was waxing lyrical about the club and he was just the, the, the picture of a pity me of utter joy. I, I, I don't know. It's, I think it is, to use a Star Wars analogy again, it's an inexplicable force, really, and shield that surrounds Celtic Park was with people that come into the club. And we are naturally biased. We we possess that every day of our lives. But mm. for it to be transferred onto others, like Jota, Cameron Carter, Vickers, Bernabe, the, the four Japanese players, Idaguchi, Maeda, Kyogo and Hitati, so quickly, <clears throat> then there are, you, you do believe in there's, there's other spirits and forces at work. But at the nub of it all, Sounds like, well, we know there's a good person and a good manager, Ange Postacoglu. And as you say, a book of Ange Postacoglu quotes would be great. Maybe working on that 
as we speak, kind of angisms or whatever you want to call it. But nah, uh, I kind of compiled a list a while ago, so I need to go back into it. But, you know, so you catch a moment in time. Steen caught it when he came in in 65. But that was like homegrown players who, you know, most had a feel for the club anyway. But to do it with players who have come from, you know, all sorts of corners of the globe and to do it within 12 months is it's quite something special. And mm. I it ha- I don't know what it is about Celtic that's got under Jota's skin and Carter Vickers' skin and, and I, I all the others, but long may it continue. Because I've never seen I've never seen a Celtic support so excited about a pre-season in all my life. Yeah. <laughs> pre-season. I've not even kicked a ball uh, in competitive football, but that game the other day, it was just like, it was the longest, people say the longest 51 days in history, you know, till they kicked a the ball in a pre-season game. And it was, it's, it's amazing. And, I, you know, you have to credit the manager for that, but no, no and, and credit the players for coming in and buying into it and, you know, accepting that they're at a place where good things could happen in their careers. Yeah, I mean, Tony, this is why you and I get along so well, because in the Venn diagram of Star Wars fans and Celtic fans, we're right there in the middle, which I always enjoy. No, I think there's there's plenty there to be aware of, and the thing that I think, picking up from what you said is, you know, we've signed our first Argentinian player, we've got a, a, a group of Japanese players, we've got an Australian manager. I think anybody coming in and seeing that, seeing the attraction for people to, to travel from the opposite side of the world and not just um from up the road or from from in Europe to, to play for us. Seeing that must make people think there must be something here to play for and I'm I'm interested in it. So it'll be interesting to see. Speaking of those Japanese players, Brian, um the strap says how pivotal will Hatati and Adiguchi be for Ange Postacoglu this season? Now I've got an interesting question from Ridiculizer to bring up um a little bit later on, but um before we do that. Um, Tony touched on it earlier. I think Hatati was head and shoulders as he should be above everybody else on pretty much everybody else on the pitch uh, in the game the other night. Um, he had a strong start for us last season. He was an instant hero, but but he kind of dropped off a little bit towards the end of the season. Do you think this rest for him, this recuperation, this chance to to recover from what was essentially a season and a half after coming from Japan, do you think we're going to see a different player going into this season? I think so, yeah. I think there was, I as well, as you two know, you've been on a live stream with me where I've watched the game, I'm very excitable. <laughs> I, do, I tend not to do post-matches because I'm a bit hyperbolic. <laughs> I'm a bit emotional. So I'm, I'm, I tend I'm, to do them even though I am hyperbolic. <laughs> I'm, I'm more shambolic. I'm more shambolic, Brian. You know what I mean? <laughs> but I remember um, when Hitati did, I said it was one of the best debuts I'd seen. And I do stand by it because I think I watched him off the ball as much as on it. And I just thought yeah. he was so dynamic and he was so brave. His passing, it was like his passing was, was two steps ahead of people. And it was almost the part, some of his passes were astray, but it was because. He was making assumptions of where players should have been. And it was sort of wonderful to watch. And I think throughout the second half of the season, he did go up and down the worst games where he wasn't as effective. But you could see the elements in it. And you could tell he was getting tired. But the fact that Ange still played him so much, I think, illustrated how pivotal he was to that midfield dynamic. Because I don't think there's anybody else like him into the team. There's better players, there's different players, but I don't think there's anyone that offers what he offers. Um, and again, especially off the ball, I think his position is excellent. And I think his link up, he started to see it, particularly with Di- uh, Dizan and Kyogo, and that sort of attacking left um, was, was excellent last season as well. So I think he's going to be a real key player. Um, Kev Graham and I were having a discussion on Wednesday about why I'm so excited about this season. And I don't think it's, it's just the fact that I'm waiting for our transfers to come in, better players. It's the fact that what Ange was able to do without having a real strong pre-season for most of that squad and getting players in and throwing them straight in and sort of almost training them as almost on the job training as they went was exceptional. And I just can't imagine those players not every one of them being individually considerably better this season. Mm. And I think that's a, a such a, an attractive prospect as a as a viewer and as a Celtic fan to watch it because 
I think guys like Hitati will improve. I think Hugo will improve. He was excellent. I think O'Reilly is going to be something special as well. I think all of these guys are going to go up, you know, 10, 15% for last season. And last season we won a double pretty in, in, in pretty good style. So I can only imagine how good we're going to be. I think Hitati is indicative of that. And I think it's going to be so important. And the Gucci, you'll notice I've not mentioned much because I don't have an awful lot to say about him yet. Mm-hmm. I've not seen enough of him to really form an opinion with any accuracy. Um, if I'm honest, I think I was under the impression he was going to be brought in as a sort of six. But anything I've seen him play, he plays sort of further forward. So mm-hmm. I know that's going to be a bearing how he how he facilitates the team. But I'm not going to be too high on him because I don't know enough, and I'm not going to be too low on him. Um, so I'll sit firmly on the fence in regards to be Gucci, but Hitati, as I've said, I, I really can't wait to see how he improves. I think he will be pivotal. Yeah, I think I think he will be as well, and I think we'll see see a bit better of him. Um, Tony, before we get to the question from Ridiculizer, which I think is an interesting topic to discuss, um, Hatati and Adiguchi. We'll start with Adiguchi just because, in a rare uh, change of habit, Brian didn't have much to say. Um, but <laughs> uh, Adiguchi, I don't know why I'm saying that. I'm I'm exactly the same, but um. Idiguchi, I think he was hampered by injury last season. I think people almost kind of forgot he was there a little bit when discussions have been going on about needing to sign midfielders. People are forgetting that he's there and able to come back in. What, if any, impression of him do you have um, and, and what kind of impact do you think he can have in the squad this season? Two words. New signing. Idiguchi yeah. played 167 minutes in total last season. So... <laughs> it's kind of expunged from the record books because he didn't make a valid contribution to the league title winning team and league cup winning team. You know, he would have kicked his heels in frustration. Had the Gucci at watching his fellow compatriots hit the ground running. There'll be nobody more determined to bust a gut and make an impression than the Gucci. And he was very good the other day. And like Brian said, I, I envisioned him as a six. And that kind of beat on roll. <laughs> he was charging forward with Billy on chasing guys down into the corner in the last minute of a pre-season friendly against a third division Austrian team. And I thought, you'll do for me. He's just an application and attitude alone. To have that in the first game back at pre-season, uh, I, you know, I kind of expected it, but I didn't expect it that much. You know, mm. but in the 90th minute, you're still harrying and chasing and and I thought, good on you, Gucci. That's and these are the kind of behaviours that Ange studies, that Ange yeah. looks for. You know, you know, there's there's no need for you to chase a guy. <laughs> just seven nothing. No, no, I'm going to chase him. That work ethic, that commitment to the team and the cause at all costs and at all times. Yeah, if that's a wee snippet of Ida Gucci moving forward, and I, I like for the opposition. But you know, if he didn't shine against opposition like that, you'd be saying. Nah, don't think. I nah, don't think he's got a future or, or yada yada. Mm-hmm. No, don't pass any judgment on Ida Gucci because I've not seen enough of him. So I, my thoughts are that you treat him as a new signing, and I think he's one that might actually pleasantly surprise you moving forward. But I tell you what, everyone's going to do. But we're going to chat his development and his progress moving forward because they want to and they want him to succeed and see if he turns out like the other three. <laughs> You've won a watch there, haven't you? Yeah. You know? yeah. And, and I don't think he will have been brought into the club because he's unlike the other three. So I'm actually looking forward to see what skill set he brings to the table. And like Brian, you know, my, my judgment's kind of reserved. But I like what I saw uh, the other night because that was a first full 90 minutes, I think, he played. Mm-hmm. And yeah, as I say, he was still chasing down Austrian third division players in the 90th minute and breaking lines. And he looked very tidy. And I'm like, Wait a minute, where's this sitter that I get to? He's charging forward and putting in crosses and, and doing a lot of things and, and looked an accomplished and tidy baller. Yeah, you know, I think so. so. I'm excited to see what he brings to us because I think, like you say, we've just not had that option available to us and I think he will. I think we prove make a valid contribution fresh. and that's all you want, isn't it? Mm. Make a valid contribution when, when you're playing minutes. So, yeah, yeah. let's see where we go. As for the not much to add about Hatati, is there? No. You know, he's been enjoying the Ayrshire Riviera, hasn't he? 
<laughs> None of your globe trotting for your man. The Air Beach, he's been training on seemingly, and you know that's I like that. I like that kind of you know no airs or graces. None of your Jota, New York, Greece, you know Ibiza, you no know, Hitachi keeping it real. You know I'm I'm an air. Lovely job. Our harkens back to the glory days. Did we not used to go and train at Seamill Hydro yeah. or something like that? Yeah, yeah. Possibly, yeah. I and mean, we've known we did. I don't know if Hitachi was at Seamill, but he was certainly. And air, he said, air beach, giving it, giving it large, as they say. Giving it large. Well, it's a, it's a, it is a lovely place to see. I don't, I think I might prefer Japan myself, but you know, no harm to the people of air. Um, <laughs> Brian, I'll, I'll ask you this first. Uh, I'm not going to lie; it's not going to be an easy question, but it was interesting enough to, to, to. To save and bring up ridiculizer says a little concerned about Hatati's mental fortitude with his comments about needing to be emotionally refreshed, etc. A professional athlete should require no more than a couple of uh, days rest to recover. Uh, Brian, it's not the first time Hatati has alluded to <clears throat> needing a rest either for physical or mental reasons, and I guess this is a probably a conversation that is evolving as time goes on in the modern day that that we are aware that there is a mental side to the game as much as a physical side and that that maybe we need to allow for that my opinion on it is he's a young guy who's traveled to the other side of the world didn't speak the language was kind of coming at a difficult time with the pandemic as it was never mind in normal circumstances i i, I have have reason to think we should be given allowances for any off the field struggles he might be having as well as on the field struggles. Am I am I being too soft? Is that that's what I'm going to ask. Am I being too soft? Should we expect more uh, Laura, you'll never be accused of being too soft. So let's just <laughs> let's just put a pin in that right now. Um, the, <laughs> the, comment, look, the thing about it is I feel like that comment's in two parts and I think this is where people need to be a bit conscious. So the first part's about his mental fortitude mm-hmm. and then the suggestion that he should play twice in a week or whatever it was. Well, that's a physical mm-hmm. aspect, right? I think what actually we should be saying is congratulations to Hitati for opening up about the fact he, he was having some difficulties, he was struggling a wee bit because so many players and so many people in so many places don't open up about these things and they struggle with it and they keep it in and it doesn't help them. Just because he's paid very well and he's an athlete doesn't mean he can't have certain mental fatigue. You don't know what's going on in the boy's life. And I think the fact he was very open and honest about it is actually really refreshing. And I think it speaks volumes about his character and his bravery to do that. Um, in terms of his physicality, you know, he played a full season as well, remember? Yeah. So he played a full season, then went for Joanne and then played um, in a high-intensity Ange team with a lot of pressure. There's no... It doesn't matter how fit you are or how strong you are, that's going to be a chore. So no they can do that. So I just think, you know, there's this, there's this thing that always winds me up, and I won't go on my high horse because we're having a good day, but people, you know, remember when Neil Lennon, when he talked about having some mental issues and certain mental fatigue, and, and people said, well, what have you got to be fed up about? You're Celtic captain. You're a millionaire. Hmm. And I think that's something that in 2022 we should really wind our neck in about because... That is not appropriate. And I don't think Hatati was necessarily talking about having mental problems, but having mental fatigue is just as damaging. So I think he was brave to talk about it. And I think it was right that um, we sort of addressed it. But to criticise him for it or suggest he shouldn't bring it up, I think it's um, the wrong direction. And I think then he's had pre-season to address the physical side of it. I think he'll flourish and I think he'll fly. But again, people need to remember footballers are just human. Whether it's physical fatigue, mental fatigue, anything off the park, and we, we have to be considerate of that. We've got the Ange and the club have got a duty of care over these players, and I think we, we just need to be cognizant of that. Yeah, um, Kevin Graham, our very own Kevin Graham, says the lad played solidly for eighteen months. New country, new language. I, of course, he's going to be done mentally and physically. He's just a human being, which is exactly what you were saying. And I think if there's one thing I know about the manager that we've got is he definitely considers the human side as much as the physical side. He, he, he strives to do that when he's signing a player, never mind when he's uh, when he's got them in the, the club. Uh, Urban Kulchi says, Jinky had his troubles and it was well handled by Jock. I didn't hear any news of Hatati being um, 
moored offshore with no oars in his boat, um, like Jinky was at one point. But um, you know, who knows what was going on in here? Um, Tony, it is an interesting point, and I think it's something that, especially, I think it'll be fine for younger fans growing up in a day and age where mental health issues and physical health issues are being seen as more synonymous. But for those of us who've been around for a bit longer, it's something that we're learning to adapt to and learning to understand and appreciate about the way players operate. First of all, do you think Hatati's shown any signs of of not having that mental fortitude, um, or 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 do you think there's anything that needs worked on there, or do you think he's doing just fine as he is? First and foremost, what an excellent answer that was by Brian. Absolutely, that, yeah. That tip to you for that big guy, because uh, there's not much I can add to that. But I think when players speak like that, football has a duty of care towards them. You know, the minute they open up. Because it takes a lot for players to open up, as Brian said. But the minute they open up, football should embrace that. And I'm sure Ange will. And he's probably used to it, you know, because he's maybe heard things like this before, having worked with a contingent of Japanese players before. So it's maybe something that he's more, you know, well-versed in. And uh, I don't think Hitati has any any problems. You know, you we've outlined it out there. He's gone from playing a, a whole season... It's like 18 months solid football. That doesn't take its toll on you mentally, mentally and physically. Then you know you're superhuman, then, aren't you? Yeah. So, so uh, and but by speaking about it, it's, it's brave in the first instance. But I think he, he's in the right place because Celtic have the the right medical staff and care round about him. You know, you, you, players cannot be allowed to. Well, not cannot be allowed, but they they have to open up, and it's more prevalent now in, in football, isn't it? Mm-hmm. And actually, it's not a sign of weakness. It's actually seen as a sign of strength that you can actually confront it and get it dealt with. And so uh, I applaud Hitati for that. And as I say, it's, I mean, I'm kind of reiterating what Brian said as well, but because I thought it was an excellent answer, to be fair. But I, I think uh, football, you know, you, you have to monitor the signs of these things with footballers. And I'm sure the medical team at Celtic do that with, with all the players and the first sign of anything going awry in terms of their personal life or mental health issues or whatever, the, they will be first on top of it to, to try and nip it in the bud and get them the appropriate help and measures necessary. But, yeah, you have to remember footballers are human, and especially that this Ange team. This Ange team were asked to peak and peak and peak and keep peaking. And then, you know, to win the title back from Rangers at the first time of asking to get qualified for the Champions League and then the first thing Angie's going to say to them this season is going to have to peak again we're going to have to peak some more because we're going into a tournament where you know they'll be at their, their peak you know so I'm going to have to ask you to drink from that well again you know some mm. people can do it repeatedly others not so much say struggle with it but it, it becomes you know an arduous and hard task but they get there in the end but the, the premise is the same He's going to have to keep building it and building it and building it. But I think if you let people know that, right, you know, I'm not struggling per se, but there's, you know, there's just underlying issues in terms of, you know, I'm, I'm feeling a bit, I'm feeling it a bit, you know. So I think that having those conversations, it's a great thing for footballers. It's a great thing for managers as well. And I think that's possibly why Anne's likes rotation. Yeah. And I think to, to touch on your point about Jota earlier with the, the Lisbon comment, I know for certain if I had been plonked in the middle of uh, Japan in my early 20s uh, with no family around me and expected to just crack on, uh, I don't know that I would have taken it in my stride either. Yeah, that and, and you know, so there's these guys have had a, an alt, a, a mighty upheaval in their life, huge upheaval in their life. And not only have they been asked to come into a team that demands that you win every week, you know, you, but you win trophies. You know, they, they've come into a, a support who's expectant as well. And they've maybe came to a situation where if they walk down the street, you know, or, or they can't walk down the street, even going to the shops to buy groceries or, or whatever, becomes something that they're just no used to. You know, that, that Glasgow goldfish bowl that people talk about, 
for outsiders, we understand that completely. Mm. Outsiders coming into that think, what is this? You know, and you've seen the manager, how, how many manager selfies I've put up and he's spoken about that. It's something you do, you represent the club and I'm sure he's drummed into the players, be a good person. But, I mean, every, uh, Tommy Burns said the finest thing ever about being a Celtic or a Rangers player. One half of the city hates you, the other half think they own you. There is no finer definition of being a Celtic or a Rangers footballer than that, is there? One half of the city hates you, the other half think they own you. And see, when you're successful, that pressure intensifies, doesn't it? And that kind of, your profile was raised, your that stardom was raised. And some people find that hard to adjust to that kind of lifestyle and cope. And, you know, you look at the... The Japanese players in particular, they all seem very humble and good, decent, honest guys, don't they? Mm-hmm. That, that adulation if they go outside, it, it might not sit well with them because it's maybe just not who they are. But it's a, it's a byproduct of being a successful Celtic player that they're having to live with and accept. And that that can, you know, that can be difficult. You know, it's... Yeah. Uh, it's well, Tony, you know how hard that is for, for you and I to deal with all the, the publicity we get and all the things you're still for pictures. So I can only imagine if you, you come away from Japan, it must be. Must be. <laughs> I think the, the pictures of me they keep beside the dartboard, do you know what I mean? Kind of, <laughs> yeah. yeah. It's, well, it's, I, I shouldn't ask him for autographs when I hear my name, I just run. So. <laughs> <laughs> I have to say, uh, the the very few times it's happened to me in public, it is nothing but anxiety and just. And I do enjoy people coming up to say they enjoy the podcast, but it, the first two seconds are are uh, are, are a little bit uh, a little bit worrying. Having said that, um, we've got a few things on over the weekend in Glasgow that uh, if if we happen to see any of you, uh, then give us a give us a wave or come over and say hello. There's the Tommy Burns story at um, the King's Theatre tomorrow, the Masters football tonight. I will be going to both. So hopefully if I see any of you there, that'll be good to, to see you. Just to close out on the the Peter, uh, sorry, the Hatat con, uh, conversation, Peter McGee just reiterates what we said and emphasises that he wants nice people at the club. So you just know there's their mental health in mind too. Of course he does. I'm sure he does. Um, Tony, you mentioned Tommy Burns. Um a famous Tommy Burns quote is about how Andy Gorham broke his heart. Um, I have to say, and I get I get a lot of stick for this a lot of the time when I do this on the podcast, but for me growing up being a Celtic supporter, my first love was Celtic, absolutely. But a big part of that first love being Celtic was an intense dislike, shall we say, for Rangers. However, I never forgot the human beings that were that were playing for the club and playing in those shirts. Uh, Andy Gorham was lost before his time this past week uh, due to esophageal cancer, um, a disease that uh, I would wish on absolutely nobody. Um, regardless of your your supporter stance or anything like that, um, I think it's fair to say Andy Gorham played a major role in breaking our hearts, all of our hearts throughout the 90s with these outstanding performances, often against Celtic. What are your memories of him as a goalkeeper? <laughs> unbeatable, wasn't he? <laughs> he was unbeatable. Tommy Burns' quote is this, when I pass away, you can put it in my tombstone, Goran broke my heart, he's probably the best goalkeeper I've ever seen. I think that, you know, if you're talking about a player's ability, I think that encapsulates it all. And I, uh, yeah, yeah. I mean, how, how many games did you go to and you cursed him? You absolutely cursed him. And uh, but he would turn around and tell you that's his job. That's what he gets paid for. And, uh, yeah, he's he's one of the best that, that uh, the country's produced, you have to say that. If you're talking about goalkeepers, he, he has to be up there. And, uh, you you know, and if he didn't save the ball, it hit the woodwork, didn't it? He seemed, he seemed to perform some kind of we do ritual in, in the frame of the goal and just had an unerring ability to keep the ball out of the net and the uh, Rangers were fortunate to have a, a player of uh, of that ability and, and talent between the sticks for them uh, at a time when Celtic were you know, chapping on the door but just not quite good enough to, to get the measure of, of the team at that time Tommy yeah. Burns team in particular I think um, with all the foreign players that, that Rangers were bringing in at the time, Brian. Um, 
having a, a, a goalkeeper, at least of Scottish descent, in the goal must have been uh, something that Rangers fans, I'm sure, would have appreciated. I, I just can't get over the fact that, you know, that so many people of that era, both on Celtic and Rangers side, side were losing. It's just sad, isn't it, no matter what, what side of the city you're from? Of course it is. And listen, we always need to remember these things. Someone's lost a, a, a loved one. And that in itself is, is tragic. Um, I can't really add too much more to, to what you and Tony have said, especially when Tony reiterated that Tommy Burns quote, because there's a real beauty in that. And I think it's really the way, you know, there's a lesson in that as well about respecting the opposition and, and, and having that level where it's not just about you know, the bitterness. It's, you can respect them on a, a sporting level as well. But I think in terms of memories, it's the, the, Hoidong, the Van Hoidong save. Winner. That's a that's one I always sort of think oh, about. Oh yeah, that was uh, unreal. That one. I mean, really, really special stuff. But it's ultimately, um, I, families lost a loved one. You know, football teams lost a, a, a great keeper, and Scottish football's lost a, a legend in it. So sad news all around. Young man taken away. Um, lost the best wishes to his family. You mm-hmm. you spoke about Van Hoydonk and I texted him last week because I was asked to get a hold of him. Yeah, to speak about Gorham and I asked him if he had anything to say and he, he sent me a text back. This is what he said. He was a great goalkeeper, not the most athletic, but an unbelievable shot stopper. I met him a few times after our careers were finished and he was a good, nice guy and always laughing. There we are. I don't think we need to say any more than that. Um, thanks everybody for watching. As I said, if you see me out on my travels at the weekend, be sure to say hello. Um, Brian, thank you for joining us uh, today. Tony, thanks again for joining us. I know you're busy with the Celtic way, so anybody who wants to see Tony's output, output get subscribed there, and he's got plenty. Um, apparently, he's better at writing than he is at speaking. I don't know. He's been pretty good today, but um, I would give his written content a go as well. Uh, thanks very much, guys. Thanks, everybody, for commenting, and we will see you again very, very soon.